Wow, sometimes acapella is the most powerful thing you can do. Love that song. Thank you, worship team. We are, um, you can go and open your Bibles to Judges chapter 2, and that's where we're going to pick up. And, and today we're continuing in our series about serving together. And uh, this is our second kind of part of serving in the gospel or serving in the mission together. And we're going to start out in a minute in Judges chapter 2. But before we go there, before we go there, um, I, I, I want to get a little, a little uh, uh, serious in a second. But first, uh-oh. Check your cord. Check my cord. I promise I can do technology. Interesting. A joke. I got dad jokes. Chase said, tell a joke. Why are cats scared of trees? Because of their bark. <laughs> can, you, can you try to do this? Yeah. You get nothing? Why can farmers jump really high? Be because, because they have big calves. Good jokes. I'm a dad. I, can't, I don't know. I give up. Okay, here we go. One more joke. Why do cows wear bells? Because their horns don't work. I'm a dad now. I can make these kind of jokes. I don't. I don't need them. Okay. It's okay. I'll just do my thing. I don't know if he sees. All right. Well, they were working earlier, but it's okay. I'm going to try to send your slides up there. I need my notes. So today we're talking about unmute, all right? And uh, it's, a, it's something, thank you for bearing with us. Hey, we're, we're a family. Sometimes stuff happens, right? So today we're talking about unmute. And... Um, and we all know what the unmuting button is now after this last year and a half, don't we? It, it's the scariest, bro, you're not muted when you're in the bathroom or whatever. <laughs> we know what that's like now. It's terrible. But today we're talking about being unmuted for Christ as we're talking about uh, serving in the gospel together. And my first point is your mute button. All right? Your mute button. And this whole idea is about how Satan is all about muting God's people. He's all about that. He excels in muting God's people. Why? Because the people of God are the only voice that can bring life to a world that Satan's trying to destroy. The people of God are the only voice that can bring love to a world that Satan is trying to bring hate to. Why is Satan trying to mute us? Because the people of God are the only voice that can bring faith to a world that Satan is filling with fear. Satan's all about muting us. And what happens when Satan wins? We get to see that a little bit in Judges 2. We're going to get kind of serious as we start out today. In Judges 2, you actually get a picture what happens when Satan mutes God's people? Judges 2, verse 6. After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. It's a great time in Israel's history. God had blessed them with the promised land. 
In verse 8, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Herez in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Sometimes when you're reading scripture, you got to practice those names. <laughs> verse 10, this is why I wanted to read this. Check this out. After the whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt, and they followed and worshiped various gods of the peoples around them. And they aroused the Lord's anger. This is a scary passage. Because what do we see right here? We see Joshua in this incredible moment. God had blessed them. And they had the promised land now. They got the 12 tribes. All the elders are celebrating God. They're able to implement the law, all this kind of stuff. But just after one single generation, God muted them from passing it to the next elders, passing it to the next leader, passing it to the next generation. And after one generation, they forsook the Lord. There's this reality that Christianity is always just one generation away from extinction. It's just one generation. It doesn't matter that it's been here 2,000 years. It doesn't matter there's a billion people around the world that have some kind of Christian faith. If Satan can just mute us for just one generation, then it goes extinct. And the same thing's true for us here at North River. I, hey, Sam and TJ, good to see you guys. I love you guys. They moved to Jacksonville. Now they're back visiting. I love y'all. Anyways, um, the, <laughs> I love being in person. Um, North River. I love what we're doing here as a church. I really do. Like, clearly. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, about how God's doing amazing things through us. But as much as how great God has blessed our church, how his love has thrown out, how hundreds and thousands of people have been blessed through this church, if he can mute us for just one generation, our church is gone. You guys following me? Muting. Satan excels in muting us. He is incredible at finding your mute button. Do you realize all of us have a mute button? Every single one of us do. And you're thinking, Wait, are you serious? Like, where's the mute button for my kids? <laughs> Hopefully you're not thinking like, man, I wish I had the mute button for my wife. <laughs> but all of us have a mute button. What's your mute button? How does Satan try to mute you? What does he do? You know, for me, I talk about it a lot. Uh, I can be muted by my busyness. That when Satan can't make you sin, he makes you busy. But recently it's been more exhaustion of just raw exhaustion. We got two kids, right? Cam, big, big deal in the Massey household. Cam started preschool this week. You know what I'm saying? Fired up for that. Uh, and of course, two days in, he got the sniffles, right? Come on, immune system, you know what I'm saying? But the, the, with our uh, eight-week-old, Caleb, is a bundle of joy, but my shift is 2 a.m., right? Anyone else, any other moms or dads up at 2 a.m.? You know, you can text me, I'm, I'm awake. And um, there's been several moments when I can, I'm like, and he's just screaming at the top of his lungs at me. And, uh, and I had no idea how to help him. And I have just honestly, like honestly, I have grimaced at the sky. Bah! just in raw frustration. And every person that doesn't have kids thinks I'm insane, but everyone that has kids, you, you understand me. <laughs> and, but during the day, after that happens at night, during the day when I have an opportunity to use my voice, when I have an opportunity to share the gospel or to, to give love or to life to somebody, uh, man, I just, my ex emotional and mental exhaustion, I'm like, I don't know if I got it in me to say something. I don't know if I have the mental bandwidth to give to another person. And Satan mutes me like that. How does Satan mute you this morning? 
You know, maybe, maybe it's something like comfortability. And, and when I say comfortability, I don't mean like, are you willing to follow Jesus or believe in Jesus? Because I believe we're a church that wants to be with Jesus, that wants to become like Jesus and wants to do what Jesus did. However, I think what can happen sometimes is that we can get comfortable with our house and with our job, with our roommates or with our families and with our little comfortable routine. And in, in this bubble of our livelihoods, we, we forget what's happening outside. And we can grow in our comfortability. You know, they were there this morning. I want to lift up Michael and Chelsea Polk as an example. There's some dear friends to Toy and I. They're the in-town ministry. They've been at North River for about three or four years. And uh, I love them. They, they love being uncomfortable for Christ. And they've decided to sell their house, to change jobs, and to move to a small church to be with some best friends to help serve and grow that church. I love that. It's so inspiring. They're moving in a couple weeks, but they have a great house. They have a great job. A, like their family, their fr well, their family as in us, like their friends are here. They, they have their livelihoods. They have everything here, but they, they have this burning desire to not just fall into comfortability and to get out on the mission field. The mission field is here, praise God. But it's also, they, they felt more called to be uncomfortable to the mission field over there. So they're moving to Ann Arbor, Michigan. And if you wonder about uncomfortability, Michael Polk is from Florida, Chelsea Polk is from California, and Michigan is someplace way up in the snow. And they're going to go spread the gospel up there. I'm inspired by the Polks. I love them dearly. But as we were talking about Satan muting us, while you can be muted and you have a mute button, you know who doesn't have a mute button? It's God. God cannot be muted. Satan is not stronger than God. Satan cannot silence God. So even though he can silence you, even though he can mute you, good thing it's not just you versus Satan. Because it's not just you versus Satan, it's you plus God. It's you with God versus Satan. So as long as you have God with you and as long as you rely upon God, Satan cannot mute you, church. And in fact, this is exactly what we were talking about. The campus had a, a conference uh, two weeks ago up in Ridgecrest, North Carolina, of all the Southeast and people from all around the country came in for a campus training conference. And our theme was unmute. And I want to give you guys a little, a little view into what's happening on campus and how the next generation is deciding to be unmuted for Christ. Let's play the video. Christianity is always just one generation from extinction. Satan. It's all about muting God's people. What does the world want to do when you talk about Jesus? It wants to keep you muted. Our society is becoming a post-Christian society. And let me tell you something right now. Our great God cannot be silenced by Satan. Following God is all or nothing. Jesus. Salvation is found in no one else. Jesus came to give up everything, blood, sweat, tears, his beating heart, everything, so that we would not remain enslaved to sin. Sometimes you don't want to always open your mouth, but you got to find the people around you that can encourage you to go and to unmute. I think I've been convicted um, about my heart for seeking and saving the lost. Coming down south to CTP at Rich Press has been so inspiring. Seeing like all of these people here, all these disciples, all of this loving people like moving, it's, it's crazy, it's honestly, it, it's, yeah, it, it's filled my heart and it's inspired me to go out and to save more people. Just the willingness of all these leaders to come out and to teach us about how to be better disciples on campus, how to evangelize, how to study the Bible with people, and just seeing the zeal in them and how that zeal spreads to us. Am I ready for this? I believe all of you are the future, the people who endure the great tribulation, who are standing in white robes because you have been cleansed with the blood of Jesus. Your voice is meant to be used for God's glory. We use our voices with eternity in mind, with heaven as the end goal. 
Bring glory to God by advancing the kingdom. Tell others of his great power that saved you and I from this dominion of darkness that we were in. It is not Satan versus you, but it is Satan versus God with you. Will your fruit last and enable your servants to speak your words with great boldness? What will our churches look like in 10 years, 20? That's entirely, entirely up to you. Amen. Flipping your Bible to uh, Isaiah 62. Being unmuted for God. But the, you got to ask, what do we need to be unmuted in? And Satan is most scared of God's unmuted love. Now that's my second point, is unmuted love. More than anything else, as disciples of Jesus, we need to use our voice and to be unmuted in God's unmuted PowerPoint. It's here. <laughs> Yay. Good job. Sound team. There we go. Isaiah 62. Great. So in Isaiah 62 and verse 5, let's read it together. As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. That's a crazy cool passage if you haven't read it recently. Because it talks about how God loves us as a bridegroom with his bride with a groom with his bride. And God, you know, the picture of love God uses in the scriptures, he uses all kinds of different pictures. We know that Jesus loves us as a brother or as a friend. We know that God loves us as a father. But right here, it's about the special love that a groom gives to his bride. And it's, and, and it's just this incredible view of God wanting to have a marital relationship with us. So let's talk about marriage for a little bit. Can we do that? So marriage, if, if, if you want to get married, what do you do? You go get a ring and you get, you know, a rock on it. And then you go down in front of your queen or princess, I guess. And you go down on one knee, right? And no matter where you're at, if you see a guy in front of a girl and they're doing this, he's not tying their shoe. <laughs> but we all know what that picture is. We know, all know exactly what that looks like. In, in fact, I try to, I nag toy all the time. I'm like, babe, when we're in crowded spaces, I'm like, babe, 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 give me your ring, give me your ring. Let me, can I just make a scene? She, she hates that, like we're in the mall and stuff like that. <laughs> but if 2,000 years ago, if we were to go back to first century Judea, if I went down on one knee in front of a girl, they would have no idea what I was doing. Like, did you, did you break your ankle? Like, what happened? And so let's talk about what it would look like 2,000 years ago, because I think this picture will be so helpful for us this morning. So if I'm a Jew living in Galilee during Jesus' day, like 2,000 years ago, and then and I like am falling for this Hebrew girl named Latoya, because I'm sure that's what they named their daughters. <laughs> and what I would do, I actually would not go down on one knee and go get some diamonds. I'd probably have no idea of that concept. But what I would do is I would first choose three friends. All right, I'll choose three friends and then I'll tell them all about Toya and I'll get them to go talk to her and invite her to a marriage with me. And I and offer my proposal. My dad wouldn't go talk to her dad first because if the dad refuses to my dad, then that's a disgrace to my family, to my dad. So first I would send my friends, my groomsmen. And the, the first people to talk to the family, the first invitation of marriage would come from my friends. Now, if, if they come back to me, my three friends come back and they say, hey, she's down, dude, it's awesome. I'm all fired up. Then I would send my dad to her dad and then they would negotiate a price Be because in that agricultural society, when you take a woman from the family, you're taking a worker from the family. And so a price needs to be negotiated. It's, it wasn't weird, it's just part of society. And once they negotiate, negotiate a price, we throw a party that night. And this banquet is epic. We got our friends there. We got our family there. We got dancing. Man, it's awesome. But then at a specific point in this uh, banquet, I stand up and everybody goes quiet. And I say, I am going to my father's house to prepare a room for you. 
And when I finish, I will come back and get to you. And that's like the proposal line. That's the, will you marry me? And then in front of everybody, I would pick up my cup and I would drink from my cup and then I'd offer it to her and I would say, are you willing to drink from my cup? And then she would stand up and then if she takes it and takes my cup and drinks from it, that's her saying, yes, I want to marry you. And so then everyone's excited and all the girls there are going, eee! or whatever kind of squealing thing they do. And then, but we're not done yet. We're not married yet. We're engaged. And so she would go back to her father's house and she would get a lantern and she would light it and she'd put it in her window and she would make sure it's always burning. And what that does is it lets the whole community know that she's taken and she's accounted for. And then what I would do is I would go back to my father's house and I would start building a room and I would go as fast as I possibly can. <laughs> and then when I'm done, I run back to her house being like Marty Solomon. <laughs> I'd run back to her house and then it could be any hour of the night and then, and then we would get her, we would get all of our friends and family and we would throw this huge celebration and we'd do this parade and that would be our official wedding. We would celebrate our marriage. Now, the first time I heard this, I went, no way! Because if you know your Bible, Jesus uses some of this exact language. It's crazy. Look in John 14 with me. John 14. And in John 14, it's the Last Supper, the night before Jesus dies. And in verse 1, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. So it's the Last Supper. The disciples know something's about to happen. They're getting anxious. They can feel it in the room. They're getting worried. They're getting scared. What's about to happen? And Jesus is thinking, how can I possibly convince my disciples of my love? Like, what's the strongest language that I could use to convince them of my love, to make it go down deep? And then he literally proposes to them. He, he stands up and he says, I'm going to my father's house to prepare a place for you. Their mouths must have... And then... I will come back and take you to be with me. He literally proposes to them. Marriage, a wedding, the deepest relationship you can have with someone on this earth. That's the level of Jesus trying to express his love to them. Do you realize how much Jesus loves you this morning? What kind of relationship he desires to have with you this morning? And that's the love that's the love that we are trying to unmute. But here's what I want us to focus on, okay? That it's the groomsmen that make the first invitation, not the groom. Next slide. It's the groomsmen. It, like the groom didn't go to the, the bride or the family himself. He sent the groomsmen, his friends. Nope, go back. Didn't make it. The first person to, pr to propose is not the groom, it's his friends. But wasn't that true with you guys? Like, Jesus probably didn't come talk to you first, but he sent his friends. Jesus probably didn't come and show up in your life and himself invite you to church or give you some, but the first experience that you had with Jesus were with his friends. He spoke through somebody else. So now to the slide in 2 Corinthians 5. The same thing's true for us, church, right? And in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14, you know, we see that all this about Christ's love, right? For Christ's love compels us. It's this love that we're talking about. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. 
We're God's groomsmen now. Jesus says, I no longer call you my servants, but I call you my friends. He says that you're the one that makes the first invitation, not me. You're the one to invite people into this message of reconciliation first, not me. This is amazing. So let's think through this. If I'm a first century Jew again in Galilee, okay? And then I want to marry this Hebrew girl named Toya. I choose three of my friends. It's not Peter, James, and John, but we'll say it's Nick, Adoya, and Jonathan, all right? And then, and I get them together and I, I'm like, guys, guys, I, this girl Toya is awesome. Like, I got to marry her. Can, can you guys, you guys go talk to her and, and ask her to marry me. But you can't go in looking like scrubs. I don't got no scrub friends, all right? Like, brush your teeth, get your fade on, like wear a tie, like whatever it is, get in there, all right? And then, and then I say like, hey, listen, and if she starts to waver, don't back down. Convince her. Like, this is the girl of my dreams, you got to get her to love me somehow. And they're like, bruh, we got it. And I'm like, all right. And then they go into the house and I'm like, it's like the longest 20 minutes of my life, right? And they come out, they come out and I'm like, guys, 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 imagine this conversation. Imagine this dialogue. God, how'd it go? Tell me everything. Like, Adoye, like what happened? And then he said, imagine Doy saying this. Well, we started talking, but man, it didn't really seem like she was open for marriage right now. So I didn't, I didn't say anything. And I'm like, whoa, well, okay, Nick, help me out, bro. How'd it go with you? And he says, well, we started to get into it, but then she kind of looked at me funny. And I started feeling insecure, like we're so different. Would she be able to hear it from me? Wouldn't it come better from someone else that's not like me? I don't even know if she would value my voice. So, man, I didn't say anything. And I'm like, okay, Jonathan, my brother, help, what did you do? <laughs> Give me some good news. And he says, well, I was getting to it. But then, when I, but then I started thinking about like, well, what if she rejects me? I don't like making people feel uncomfortable with them not liking me. Like, what if, she what if she rejected me and said no? And I'm like, wait a minute. What are you talking about? They wouldn't, she's not rejecting you. She'd be rejecting me. It's not about you. It's about me. You're not trying to marry her. I'm the one trying to marry her. I'm the one that loves her. She's not, it's not about you. Church. Whatever mute button Satan wants to use on you, don't let Satan mute God's love in your life. Don't let him do it. It doesn't matter how tall or short you are. It doesn't matter how black or white you are or rich or poor or tall or whatever, because it's not about you. It doesn't matter if you're a good speaker or if you're terrible at it, because it's God's love speaking through you. All that matters is God's love. It's not, they're not rejecting you. They'll be rejecting God. They're, you're not trying to get them in a relationship with you. You're trying to get them in a relationship with God. And God, for some crazy reason, has chosen us to be his groomsmen and bridesmaids. For some crazy reason, like, could God spread his kingdom of love better than us? Duh. Duh. But for some crazy reason, he chooses us to spread his love. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? How insane is it that God has chosen you to spread his love? But don't let yourself get in the way of his love. Unmute God's love in your life. But here's the crazy thing. When you unmute God's love in your life, you don't just change that person's day. You don't just change that person's life. You change their eternal destiny. In fact, when you open up and whether it's you're inviting someone to church or you're inviting them into your house for hospitality or you're inviting them to a Bible study, whatever that love looks like, that becomes the most important conversation in that person's life. It's because the first time they're coming into contact with the kingdom of God. I'll never forget 
two, the second week of January, 2009, I was sitting in the Georgia Tech dining hall in the in Woodruff dining hall. The week before, I got caught twice by the cops, and Marcus Austin opened up his mouth and was unmuted with God's love. And he talked to me about God, and he talked to me about coming to Bible talk, and that was the beginning of not just my life, but my eternal destiny changing. At that point, it's the most important conversation in my life. But what's crazy is when you unmute God's love in your life, then God's love starts flowing through other people, to other people, to other people. And it doesn't just stop at them. And I want to go through a couple friends of ours here at North River, because that happens all the time at North River. And so let's look at how this works, okay? So this is Alex and Jasmine. We love Ajax, right? And um, Chris Carter unmuted himself, and uh, God's love flowed through him to Alex Jackson, and Alex committed to Jesus and got baptized back in 2007 at Georgia Tech, right? Then he met this crazy dude on campus named Jordan Massey. And uh, in 2009, that kind of looks like an album cover, right? You know, not half bad. But in 2009, Ajax helped me commit my whole life to Jesus. But then it wasn't about me. It was about God's spirit in me. And so then God let me and used me to help my brother get baptized in 2011. At one point, he had crazy hair. You know what I'm saying? Um, do pray for Jonathan. Him and Seba went to visit South Africa to visit her family. And they got COVID. Now they're stuck in South Africa. Their symptoms are, haven't been bad, so praise God, but pray for a recovery and that they'll be able to come back to the States. Um, so he got baptized in 2011. That was like one of the greatest days of my life, seeing my brother accept Jesus as Lord. Then Jonathan befriended this dude named Sam Karanja, right? And Sam over at Georgia State, and then God's love spoke through Jonathan to Sam, and then Sam in 2014 got baptized. And then Sam met this awesome dude named Juan Cortez over at Georgia State. And, Juan, and then Sam, God's love was unmuted in Sam's life and transformed uh, Juan's life. But then, of course, it wasn't done there. God's love spoke through Juan, and then it transformed Jordan Brown's life in 2019. And then just this last semester, Jordan Brown uh, was living with his roommate, Jordan Evans, and then God's love spoke through Jordan, Jordan Brown to speak to Jordan Evans, and I was in the study too. It was just a bunch of Jordans, but we were all praising God together. It was awesome. Man, but Ajax, or even Chris Carter, who's not on here, when he first talked to Ajax, he had no idea. He had no idea what was going to happen. And it's not about these people on this screen, but it's about what happens when God's love is unmuted in our lives and how much it changes people's souls. Amen? Amen. All right, let's talk about some practicals before we take communion together. All right, number one. Isolate your mute buttons, what mutes you, and meditate on why you're muted in that way. I think this can be a time for healing and prayer and meditation for us, because for some of us, it's a deep-rooted insecurity, or it's some way we view ourselves. For others of us, it might be a lot more simplistic or a lot more shallow, but to, to take some time to work that through with God. And then number two, and then next week, unmute God's love in your life by inviting someone to get together to look at the scriptures. Now, whether that's come to church or come over for dinner or talk about God or to get in a Bible study, the reality is the greatest way to give somebody God's love is right here. It's what it's all about. And, and I will give you guys this little tidbit. There's this awesome sister in, in town named Chris. And um, three or four weeks ago, we talked about hospitality, about eating and drinking. You guys remember that? And, and then I had a very similar, like, hey, at some point, you just got to do it. Like, you can't just keep talking about it or thinking about it. You just, Nike, just do it. Just go, go be hospitable. Go love somebody, right? So she said she took that seriously. And she went and talked to her neighbors in her apartment complex. And she invited them over. And they were going to do Taco Thursdays. And so on Tuesday, before Thursday, she went to the grocery store to get the tacos. And long story short, when she comes back to her apartment, there was a tree in her living room. She was sitting there telling me the story, and I didn't quite connect the dots. But then at a certain point, she goes, no, Jordan, 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 Jordan. If I wasn't practicing hospitality and following through on your practical, I would have been in my living room. And I don't know what happened, but I, I'm so grateful I listened. So if you're looking for some motivation to do the practicals... <laughs> 
If you could read a book with someone and cure their cancer, would you do it? If you could read a book and cure their AIDS, would you do it? And if you could read a book and you could change their eternal destiny, would you do it? I know you would. And that's what we're all about at North River. We're about not letting Satan mute us and letting God's love flow through us. Amen? Let's pray together for communion. God, we are so grateful for your love. Father, we know Satan wants to destroy your love. He's scared of your love. He wants to do whatever he can against us to stop your love from working and speaking through us. God, I pray that we can rely upon you and let your love overpower the dominion of darkness. And God, we're so grateful. We're blown away. We don't understand what it means that you want a, a marital relationship with us. And even as we take this communion right here, we remember at that last supper, when you, when you took the cup and you offered it to the disciples, will you drink from my cup? And right now during this communion, we reaffirm our vows to you that we want this relationship. And we're so grateful for Jesus giving us a chance. And we're also reaffirming that we'll let your love flow through us. And I pray that your love can shine bright as the dawn through North River. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.